Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, where James Urban will be discussing using trees and soils to manage urban stormwater. My name is Lita. I'm the creative director at DeepRoot, and I'll be walking through a few quick things before we begin. Uh, the first is that I think some people are having trouble logging in. I'm not sure if anybody is able to uh, get the audio, but not the video. It seems to be a problem on GoToWebinars, and um, I'm really apologetic about that because I know this was a really popular uh, topic. So if you can hear me, I would say continue, keep trying um, to connect, and hopefully we'll be able to get this worked through soon. Um, for the rest of you that were able to make it on welcome, we are recording the webinar. A link to it will be included in a follow-up email that will go out to everyone later this afternoon. So um, anyone who wasn't able to make it due to technical problems or scheduling conflicts will be able to view the recording. Um, attendees will be muted throughout the presentation. So um, you, we won't be able to hear you. And if you have a question, just submit it using the chat box in the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. And at the end of the webinar, I will speak those out loud, and we will all be able to hear Jim's responses. Lastly, we're experimenting with making our webinars into multimedia experiences. So if you have any thoughts or ideas on this topic that you want to share during the presentation, please tweet them to us using the hashtag UrbanTrees. Um, Jim has agreed to answer 10 additional questions on Twitter after the presentation is over. And if you want to submit a question that way, you can do so using that urban trees hashtag and addressing the tweet to us using our handle, which is Rethink Trees, and it's also up on the screen. So our presentation today will be led by James Urban. He specializes in the design of trees and soils in urban spaces. He has written and lectured extensively on the subject of urban tree planting and has been responsible for the introduction of many innovations, including most of the current standards relating to urban tree plantings. Jim was awarded the 2008 ASLA National Medal of Excellence for his contributions to the profession. He is the author of Up By Roots, Healthy Soils and Trees in the Built Environment. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jim. And Jim, you should get a little window on your screen saying you've been made the presenter. OK. And then I'm ready to uh, get a full screen here. Great. And we can see you. So everything is going fine. OK. Is that up and running? OK, uh, well, welcome everyone who's uh, signed on. I understand that there may be some technical problems signing on today. We're not sure why, but uh, maybe more people will be joining. Uh, so today, uh, we're going to talk about ur urban stormwater treatment um, and with an emphasis on, on trees. Um, you will find that most of the emphasis is going to be on soils because the trees pretty much take care of themselves um, if you get the soil right. So we're, we're going to be talking mostly about soil. And then um, I'm getting a little feedback here. Uh, You're getting feedback? Yeah. So, something squeaky is happening. Is that any better? Uh, yeah. yeah OK. Fine. OK, um, so we're going to be uh, so trying to solve the soil problem. And then at the very end of the process, you just fit the tree in. Um, uh, but uh, uh, keep remembering that we're, we're doing this to, to support trees. Um, but there's some other really cool things that happen when you combine the, the soil needs for trees um, and, uh, uh, and stormwater uh, together. You get some very good benefits out of that. So we have this, um, we've been seeing this paradigm shift in, in, in the professions of landscape architecture and engineers um, mm -hmm. uh, in the way we build our cities uh, with respect to water. Um, but are we, as landscape architects, I'm, I am a landscape architect, um, or even engineers, civil engineers for that matter, expert um, at this new uh, approach? Um, and I'm not sure that we are. Uh, I see an awful lot of errors that are being made um, in, in stormwater systems that are designed that, that don't appear to work very well. Jim? 
Jim, are you able to hear me? Jim? Between um, rainwater and human development by essentially getting rid of, of the water as fast as we can. Um, but we have to remember with this new paradigm uh, that when we, uh, that we don't uh, introduce uh, old conflicts and old problems uh, with, our, with our new ideas. So every idea that an engineer came up with to get the water away from the building pavement as quickly as possible is basically done to solve some kind of problem. Um, and we better be sure that we understand what all those problems were um, for the last 2,000 years of construction development uh, so that we don't uh, recreate them. And as an example, um, the old paradigm was get the water away very fast. Um, steep slopes were good, flat slopes were bad. And we had a slope tolerance of somewhere for, for walking and driving surfaces of somewhere between 2 and 15 percent. Um, um, ADA pushed us down to between 2 and 5 percent or 2 and 8.33 percent. But we still build walkways and drives at up to 15 percent. Um, and we were building planted areas at 15 to 20 percent or even steeper. Um, if we're trying to manage water um, in this new way, steep slopes are bad and flat slopes are good. And our slope tolerance has now shrunk to between zero and about 1.5 percent in planted areas, um, which is uh, quite uh, a, a different um, a set of problems to solve. Uh, uh, when we're designing these systems. Jim, are you there? Jim? Jim, can you hear me? Yes, it depends where. Yeah. If it's against the building, I would think that would be yeah, different. Yeah, but, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but if it's Lena? Yeah, I mean. Lena, you suddenly come on there. Um, so all, only this last goal of runoff reduction is covered under the national stormwater standards. The other goals are covered uh, uh, only at the local level, and some of them are not, uh, many of them are not covered at all. Uh, so we're going to deal with runoff reduction uh, primarily today. Um, what we're trying to do is to either flow, uh, reduce the, the flow velocity in, in downstream um, waters, or what they call flatten out the hydrograph peak, which is to take the intensity of the storm and spread it out uh, over a longer time period. Um, and that is called detention. Um, in the parlance of engineers um, and within the laws of, uh, that we read. Um, so it's the same amount of water leaving the site. It just takes longer for it to leave the site. And then there's flow volume reduction or retention um, in which the water is held on the site and never leaves the site. It's either infiltrated back into the soil or it's harvested, harvested and reused as irrigation water or um, uh, flushing toilets or, or whatever. Jim, can you hear me? To these. Hey, Jim. Jim, yes. can you hear me? Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we're having um, some technical difficulties. I know a lot of people aren't able to log in and see your slides at all, and we're also getting some audio problems, at least on my end. Would you mind um, calling in through your landline? Sure. It will just take a couple of minutes. Um, if everyone could just bear with us, I'm sorry about this. Uh, we hope to have Jim back on the line with a better um, audio connection shortly. And Jim, you'll want to turn off the sound on your computer so that you don't hear an echo.
Hello? Great. Can you hear me, Jim? Yep. Great. We can hear you as well. Thank you. Sorry okay. to interrupt your presentation. All right. Um, should I backtrack or just keep plowing ahead? Because we've used um, up I think up let's plow time. ahead because we're yeah because we're having we're having trouble. Thank you for asking. Okay. okay. So. so um, oh, but Jim, sorry. You, yeah. you need to mute. You need to mute the sound on your computer because now we're okay. hearing it repeat. All right, and I do that by. Uh, there should be a button at the top that has like a speaker with a slash through it, or you can just turn the audio. Yeah, I, uh, I think I did turn it down. Yeah, I, th it's, I think it's off. Okay. Is, it off? Is that better? It's a little echoey, but um, I think that's probably the best we can do. It's better than having you drop out. Okay. Yeah, I can, I can hear the echo uh, in the phone here. Um, Nobody, we shouldn't be able to hear anybody other than you and I, which is why I'm a little confused about this. But um, why don't you, why don't you go ahead and we'll try it for another right. minute or so, and if we're still having trouble, oh, we'll regroup. Okay, I think I, uh, did I solve that problem? It sounds like I it went so. away. I think so. Yes, it yep. does sound like okay. it went away. Okay, so um, we're going to be going over these six um, ideas today, uh, very very quickly in, in a set, uh, you know, what are the critical things you need to know about designing an urban stormwater system? And the principles we're going to talk about today apply whether that system is an open rain garden stormwater uh, system or more conventionally uh, what we're seeing, um, or some kind of underground, um, under pavement uh, system, uh, such as you might do with silver cells. Um, and uh, even though this is uh, 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 sponsored by Deep Root, which obviously is the silver cell supplier, I've tried to make this presentation very generic uh, so that you can fit these principles into anything uh, that you're working on. So let's uh, dive right in here. Uh, now my okay, here we go. So we're gonna, uh, I thought we'd start with a little bit of soil water dynamics. Um, you know, what is the, you know, how does water interact with soil? Because um, this, this first principle will apply to um, uh, most of the other, other principles. Um, and we're going to look at how soil properties change these relationships. Uh, a little discussion on what really happens in soil with detention versus retention. Um, bogs and swamps. Uh, and why we want bogs and not swamps, uh, soil interfaces, and an important item called water piping, um, which is one that most of us are, are missing. Uh, so these physical aspects of soil, when, when we talk about soil, we, we most often start with the texture of the soil, which is basically just the sand, silt, and clay. And we look at nutrients and pH and organic matter, and that's pretty much uh, where our thoughts of soil stop. In, in most soil specifications. Um, but there are, two, two, there are two other physical aspects of soil, the structure, how the soil is stuck together, and the density of the soil, how much it's actually compacted, um, and also how air and water moves through uh, the soil column or the soil profile um, and the soil biology. Um, and what we're seeing is that the interrelationships of structure, density, and profile are critical to understanding water movement in the soil. Um, and so if we miss those three elements um, in thinking about the design of these systems, um, we can make them so they easily so they don't work, or they might work uh, too, too fast and don't do anything, or might work so slowly that they cause other problems. So we need to know the soil type, um, you know, the amount of sand, silt, and clay. Um, and you can see in the upper right-hand corner um, an unscreened sandy loam soil and a screened sandy loam soil mix. And those big balls of soil, which are stuck together um, in the unscreened uh, soil, um, is, are really critical to how that soil drains um, and how that soil might, might perform. So by having an unscreened soil, I can have a lot more silt and clay in the, in, in the, the, the actual 
com composition of the soil, but then um, I can still get drainage between the peds um, uh, if, if I've got enough peds in there. Um, and then how that soil compacts or is compacted will have a, a very significant uh, uh, impact on um, uh, how, how fast the whole system drains. And then on the lower left, you see the sand compost bioretention mix, which is pretty typical of what many of us are using. Um, and these soils just drain extremely fast. Um, and when we're starting to test the, the, how much these, these soils do for us in terms of how long they hold the water and what they remove from the water, we're, we're, we get more disappointing results. So the compaction in this soil um, is is really critical. So I can take a, a really, if it, unless it's a, uh, an extremely sandy mix, if I have much sand, uh, much silt and clay in the soil at all, um, I start compacting that uh, material. I can make it so it doesn't drain uh, very, very fast. Uh, even a very sandy loam soil, one that, that appears to drain um, even when compacted to the upper 85% or 90%, uh, can, the drainage rate just absolutely plummets um, as you get to the, the very um, top end of the compaction, uh, compaction line. Um, and so why, why is that so? Um, and to, to get to that answer, we need to look at capillary water versus gravity water. Uh, so you start out in any soil, and you'll find that there are these small channels and spaces between the soil particles um, uh, called macropores. Um, and then between the individual particles, there are smaller uh, part, uh, spaces called micropores. Um, and the micropores hold water by capillary action. The, the water is held in there by surface tension. Um, the macropores is what uh, are what allows the, the soil to drain uh, through. And generally, the macropores are between the peds, um, and the 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 um, and the micropores are are between individual soils particles. And as we break the peds down, we end up with more micropores and uh, uh, less macropores. In a good soil. Um, typically, 20 to 25 percent of that soil volume is gravity water, or, or macropores, and about 20 to 25 percent um, is uh, capillary water um, held in the micropores. And it's only the capillary water uh, that's doing us any good in, in this system. So we need we need capillary water, but if we don't, if we get rid of the the, the gravity water, um, it uh, it, it also doesn't do us any good because we never release that, that water um, out. Um, so once, uh, so if we start with the, with the soil completely full of water at saturation after the storm, it starts to drain down, um, releasing the water out of the macropores. And that generally happens anywhere from an hour in a very sandy soil to uh, 24 or even 36 hours in a, a, a heavier clay or soil. Um, and at that point, the only um, way in which additional water can get out of the soil is either by roots uh, extracting water um, or uh, with um, uh, wind blowing over the soil and evaporating the, the, the water out. Um, and once the, the roots have pulled all the water they can pull out, uh, the plant begins to wilt, and that's called wilt point. And in most soils, there's still an awful lot of water left in the soil. In sandy soils, there'll be uh, uh, very little water left in there. Um, but no matter what you do, you, it's hard to exceed this 20 to 25 percent uh, capillary water that is uh, useful um, uh, for both the plant uh, and for the stormwater equation. So let's look at this retention-detention problem, because um, that's going to play into uh, the way we're going to design these things. Um, we have the surface water flowing in. And if we have reliable percolation um, in the surrounding soil, uh, we can be
begin to infiltrate uh, fairly large amounts of water uh, and, and keep it on the site. And that water is retention soil, re retention water. Uh, any excess would, in the top diagram, would overflow and continue across the surface downstream. Um, but if we don't have reliable percolation and we build one of these systems, um, we have to put in some kind of a subsurface drain line, which means the water is going to stay there for anywhere from an hour to 24 hours, and then we'll pass through into the, the subsurface system um, out into a storm drain or daylight. And so that water is slowed down, but it still exits the site, and that's the detention water. Now, what's the difference between a bog and a swamp? Um, a, a swamp is actually moving water. It, it may not look like it's moving very fast, uh, but in this case, those little green plants floating on the water there when we're out in the swamp are actually moving. You can see them move with the flow of water. Um, and a bog is stagnant water, so it's a, a trapped body of water. Um, and generally, bogs are often anaerobic, meaning there's no oxygen in them. And there are very few plants that grow in bogs. Um, trees do not grow in bogs. And most of, like red maple we think of as a, a wet-footed plant, can grow in water, or in this case, this is tupelo and bald cypress. Uh, they grow in swamps, but they, they will not grow in bogs. Um, unfortunately, when we have a failure of a stormwater system, we've created a bog, is usually what happens, and things stop growing um, in the, the, that, that soil. So when, things, when the water slows down to too slow uh, an extent, um, and the water begins to pond on the surface um, and within the system, um, plant growth uh, stops, uh, things die, and we have a pretty yucky mess on our hands. Um, often it is the, the mulch and the organic matter we put in the soil that causes the soil to go anaerobic. So if we just had a sandy soil, um, it wouldn't get that anaerobic uh, odor. It only gets the anaerobic odor from the, the fresh organic matter that we've added either to the top uh, in form of mulch or into uh, the soil in, term, in terms of, of compost. Um, I was out at the beach uh, last week, and we had rain the first week uh, we were there. And toward the end of the second week, it's, not, it's now not rained for about seven or eight days. And I noticed that the, the storm drain uh, bioswales uh, along the edge of the road are still completely full of water at the same level that they were uh, right after the rain. And they're kind of an icky, gooey-looking um, uh, mess. And this is kind of a bog. Um, so I took my beach shovel uh, and dug in there to see what I could find. And I found this thick layer of anaerobic organic goo in the, on the top, um, and then some soft sand below that, and then very hard sand. Uh, sand, uh, this is only a plastic shovel, so I'm just working with the shovel that my granddaughter left me. Um, but it's, uh, I, uh, I can't penetrate it. Now remember that we're sitting on an Atlantic coastal sand barrier island. The entire environment that I'm, you're looking at in this image is, is sand. There's no, uh, there's no silt or clay um, in uh, any of the ambient soil. It's just sand. So you would think it would drain very, very well. Um, but the compaction in the sand combined with the organic uh, material that's built up on the surface uh, of this, um, uh, this bed has created a layer that just simply will not drain. Um, and we, we see these, um, and I think we're going to see more and more of them in um, these bio swales that we're, we're building. There's another um, uh, thing that slows water down. Um, and that's called a soil interface, where you have two kinds of soils, uh, one on top of another, or two different compaction levels, one on top of each other. Um, and what they do is that the soil tends to stay um, in the upper layer and not want to move down into the lower level. Um, the, the picture uh, on the uh, right-hand side is, is a, a hole. Um, we're actually
actually not yes. seeing that slide. For some reason, we're still on your last one. Did you did you switch slides already? Yes, I, I did. Maybe try going back and forward again just to jog the system. OK. We're still uh, on um, you using your granddaughter's. Uh, all right. <laughs> all right. We have the, um, I'm now, I switched ahead to a third slide. So it's. OK. Let's just give it a minute to try to catch up. OK. OK. Now we're, I'm on, what we're seeing is, uh, water movement through the soil, soil space right. okay. water. Right. Okay. Thank you. So, so you see the hole um, uh, on the right, and that's a planting hole that a plant is growing in. The surrounding soil in that uh, area drains actually quite well, uh, not quite well, but it, it is draining soil. There's no uh, standing water within the soil um, uh, between the plants, but the hole that the contractor dug um, to plant the plant. Uh, and filled full of soft soil. Um, and then uh, uh, there's a drip irrigation line you can see running through the top. The drip irrigation uh, on the top of the hole, there's a thing that looks like a stick, but that's a drip line. And the drip line puts water in this hole. Uh, the water can't get out of the hole fast enough. Um, and so we're, we're killing plants uh, in perfectly good soil. Now, the soil in this part of the bed was more compacted than the rest of the bed. And it was only the plants in this one part of the bed that, that died. Uh, the rest of the plants did just fine. So a little bit difference in compaction made a huge difference um, in the ability of the water to leave the hole, um, the planting hole. Um, we also have contaminants within those soils. Um, uh, we talk about oils uh, on, you know, coming off of parking lots. They're actually fairly small um, now because we take such good care of our, our cars. Um, this, this oil you see sitting on this water is actually gasoline that's leaking out of a gasoline tank uh, from a piece of construction equipment upstream. Um, but you don't see that very often. Uh, more often in northern areas, we have salt. Uh, especially in retail uh, districts, um, and that can get into our, our beds. Um, I had been of the opinion that soil salt uh, was not killing trees, um, but I have recently been seeing uh, instances where, where uh, trees in retail environments um, are actually being outright killed uh, by the salt in the, the water. Um, and I think that, that that may have to do with changes in weather patterns um, uh, and or uh, changes in our, our attitudes toward how much ice we will accept uh, in um, our re retail environments. It seems retail is the, the, the one place where this is really a nasty problem. OK, the third aspect, or the last aspect we have to look at is something called water piping. Um, so here we have an inlet that is a sealed inlet, uh, and the water is supposed to build up in this bioretention bed and go over the top of this screen when it overflows. But actually, very little water ever flows in through the top. What happens is that the water gradually wears a hole if there's a, if there's a leak in the system, and there often are. The pipes aren't connected um, very tightly. Uh, there can be a small hole at the bottom of the of the of this inlet on the outside of the inlet, and the water will just find a way through there um, and carry the the fine particles with it, actually creating a pipe uh, along the edge of of something um, or even right through the the system, um, and the, the water will begin to to drain down the pipe rather than going through the soil. We obviously don't want that. So we need to make sure our, our pipe connections are very, very tight um, uh, as we move from um, soil to uh, drain systems. Um, and this particle migration can, can actually cause undermining of pavements. So here are some pavers that uh, the, the water was moving at such a, a velocity that it actually uh, lifted and washed out all of their bedding material. So, what is too fast and what is too slow? Um, we've found that five inches an hour for our, our, our soil, when it's compacted to about 85%, is too fast. It's not doing very much for us. At one inch an hour, uh, we're starting to create other 
uh, potential problems in the soil, and two to three inches an hour when it's compacted um, uh, to 85 um, percent is, is just about the right uh, target we should be looking for, which is a soil that's about 55 percent sand and 30 percent soil and 10 percent compost. We can increase the soil if we can keep more peds in, in the soil. All right, let's move on to number two, which is getting water to and into uh, the system. Uh, we're going to talk about the grading and drainage um, area calculations, um, the, the restricted openings, um, and sizing the system uh, to the drainage area. We have this idea that water flows um, uh, across the pavement, um, usually at a 45 degree angle, uh, to the curb line. Um, uh, and that if we put our structures at the curb line, uh, it'll pick up water. Uh, but a lot of times we find that, there, that the, the, the world is not actually graded that way. Um, and so what I've started doing is carry, carrying little bottles of water with me. And when I see something that just doesn't look quite right, I'll pour water um, down to find the fall line. And in this case, you can see that no water actually ever goes into uh, this stormwater bed, um, uh, but just flows down the, the, the pavement because the fall line is, is there's no cross slope on this pavement. And you'll be surprised if you start doing this how often this actually occurs. We make these restricted openings into our system with the idea that, well, we make a hole, the water will go in it. Um, but Water really doesn't like to turn corners. Once it's got some velocity to it, it wants to go straight. Um, there's a, a principle called laminar flow, where if you make the radius large enough, the water will bend around that corner, uh, hugging the corner with uh, by uh, uh, surface tension of the water. Um, but we need a pretty big radius, like this. The radius on this uh, diagram, um, the yellow one, is about right. Uh, the blue one is not really going to develop much laminar flow. And we can also use gravity by putting a very steep drop onto the throat of whatever um, system we're doing. But you have to get it up to about 8 to 10 percent um, in order to have gravity begin to overcome the, the velocity of the water moving, wanting to move directly across this opening. Um, some places have tried using cheater curbs to uh, uh, overcome this problem. Uh, but generally, I see the systems, um, we're making them too narrow, uh, too small, too low. Um, and I really don't think an awful lot of water is, is, is going in some of these really small systems. We're designing these so they look good, um, and, but we're forgetting the hydrology of what it is that we're doing. Um, and, and if it looks good, in my opinion, it probably doesn't work. Uh, our ideas of what looks good is very neat, tidy, small, uh, slick, um, but small and slick um, is not going to make it. Um, so when we're talking about sizing these systems, we're going to find that they actually need to be quite large. Um, and uh, we're, in, we're taking up increasingly larger amounts of space for these systems. The good news from the tree perspective is that all this soil is perfectly good for, for trees. Um, and I'm sure that the trees in, in these pictures will prosper and do quite well um, in, in the future because they've got fairly large volumes of soil and they've got a pretty good water source uh, to make them, make them work. But it is important for us to size these systems um, so we know how much water we think we're going to get through them. Um, I was at an ASLA tour during a conference, and we were looking at this really slick-looking um, stormwater system that everybody was you know, saying, oh, isn't this wonderful, and how good does it look? And I asked the designer who was there, how much water did he actually uh, treat in this system? How big was the drainage area? And he had no idea. He said, we never calculated it. We just, you know, here's how big a space we had to work with, and we just designed this thing. Um, so we're spending an awful lot of money, um, and I don't think we should be designing uh, these things without making calculations. So if we use a 20% um, capacity in soil, 
which is a good number to start with, um, we will find that if we want to um, treat 2,000 square feet of paved surface area um, with a 1.25 uh, inch uh, storm, which is the 90% the storm or the P storm, um, we need about 1,000 cubic feet of loam soil um, in order to do that. Uh, and it's co I don't think it's, in, uh, it's not coincidental that that happens to be the amount of soil that I've been pushing for. If our trees are spaced at 33 feet on center, which is a good spacing, 30 to 35 feet, um, in a parking lot or along a street, uh, we find that we, at, at that spacing, with that soil volume, we begin to pick up um, all of the stormwater in that 90% pea storm. Um, in the right of way or in the parking lot. Uh, so the, the, the numbers of requirements for trees and the number of requirements for stormwater actually fit very, very nicely um, in the same location. Now let's look at the se uh, sediment and debris filters. And this is another area where I'm seeing uh, lots of failures. Um, with this water as it comes into the system has got a lot of things in it and we can't really let those uh, go in. Um, so we have clogging at the restricted openings and some idea of something called a forebay. This is that very famous uh, set of uh, bioretention beds in Portland uh, that everyone photographs um, uh, and won all kinds of awards. Uh, but the, the two times that I've been there, the, the the system, the entrances were clogged. Uh, once I was there in the fall and it was full of, of uh, newly fallen leaves and no water could get in. And another time we went in the summer and you see that the entire channel is filled with sediment. And the fingers you see on the, um, uh, that little grate is uh, the fingers of Kevin Perry who said he came down in the spring and cleaned these out himself. He actually designed these things. Um, and he wanted to see, you know, how quickly do they fill up. And so in just a few months, uh, they completely filled up with sediment. Um, and so we, we've got to make these things bigger. Um, and all over the place, when you, go, you look um, at these restricted openings, uh, you'll see that they're quite filled with debris um, and leaves. Um, so this, uh, on the left-hand side, you see um, where the opening has filled up. Um, and there's really very little water that, that goes into that system uh, because of the little dam that builds up in, in the front. Um, <coughs> and um, I see all kinds of strange things when I, when I walk around this particular thing uh, on the left where we have the, the catchment uh, uh, piece to pick up the water coming off the railroad, but then they, they put all these rocks and riprap over the opening and so when you look down in the grate, the whole um, catchment basin is full of uh, material, and maybe that's the forebay. And it doesn't appear from looking at the debris field that any water at all goes in the second entry, which is downstream uh, and seems to be the overflow uh, for, for the system. So um, uh, we've got to, we really have to think more about how these things actually work. Um, this is about the size four bay that I think we need to include in our systems. Um, you'll see there's no bar over the top. Um, it's, it's a very generous wide opening. It's got a concrete floor on it. It's easy to clean um, um, and probably needs to be cleaned every year at least, uh, depending on what the sediment load upstream uh, from this uh, structure is. Um, this is one of the, in, in Portland, where they built a lot of these things, the, they have been making the, the entrances bigger, um, and they also don't plant anything right at the entrance, so, they're, so it's easy for them to, to clean. And the plants themselves actually uh, form a, a barrier uh, that helps to filter out some of this. Um, you'll see that somebody's planted a tree right at the entrance uh, to the uh, the, 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 the storm system, and uh, that tree, if it grows, is going to completely fill that hole with wood as the trunk flare develops and block the, 
the, the system up. So with that, that uh, opening in the curb really needed to have been downstream uh, from the tree. All right, let's, now we get the water into our system, and it may be flowing across the surface, or it may be uh, in some uh, water distribution pipes under, under the pavement. Um, and how does that water move from uh, the entrance point into the soil? Uh, and so we're going to talk about uh, how we deal with the cross slopes and the, the slopes um, within the street system, check dams, um, uh, surface water movement, uh, the idea of raised inlets, um, distribution from exfiltration pipes, and distribution through pervious pavers. So this is the typical section that many of us draw. Um, and there's always an assumption that there's going to be some headwater, water that's free water that's going to be above the soil line, um, which is going to essentially force, uh, with water pressure, the water into the, the soil and spread it out over the whole bed. And we, we draw these cross sections, and, and there's some, some implied detention and some implied retention in there. Um, you see the raised overflow uh, to uh, deal with water that's uh, uh, above the, the point where we have the headwater. Um, and the problem is we, we don't draw the section in the other way. And if we draw the section longitudinally um, parallel with the curb, and the curb is usually sloped. It might be sloped at 3% or 4%. This is about a 3% slope in this drawing. Um, you're going to find that that cross-section doesn't work when you get uh, upstream from uh, the, the, the end of this uh, um, diagram. And we, draw, we usually draw the section at the, the low end. Um, so at the upper end, as we move to the left, our retention soil really disappears. The detention soil, which is uh, not as good as the retention, um, uh, it gets less, and we also see that we lose waterhead, um, so that the only place we're really getting a lot of water flowing into the soil is down at the, the low end of the, the system. Um, and so we need to account for that uh, in our calculations uh, of the amount of water that, that we're thinking we're storing and treating um, into these systems. So the way you can overcome that is through a series of check dams where you will build some kind of structure that, that uh, allows you to have relatively flat spots um, on your slope uh, with overflow weirs. Um, I'm seeing in some places they build these check dams out of gravel. And uh, here are these gravel check dams, which look like they could be working, but you can see that there's only water ponding in the, the, the lower part of this uh, system. Um, and no water ponding uh, in the upper part because uh, the water flows right through the check dams. So, so these check dams have to be hard structures. They have to be made of something that water uh, can flow over the top of, but not flow uh, through or underneath or around. So they, they get to be fairly expensive. So, I'm, I'm getting some Lita? Yeah, I, I am too. I'm, I am not sure what that's about. I assume it's related to all of the technical difficulties on, okay. on GoToMeetings then. So sorry about that. Let's just... Okay. So uh, how water flows through this system, uh, this is those famous uh, Portland uh, ones that win the award and everybody looks at. It. And they were originally designed that the water would flow through um, uh, as this blue line goes in. So the water comes into the uphill side, flows through the system, flows out the other end and back in, and kind of snakes its way down through these treatment beds. But they found that that was actually not the way they worked. Uh, what they do was the water flows into the, the first system. Um, when the water at the low end reaches uh, its, its elevation, um, then no more water goes in the top because uh, it, it releases, the pressure releases out the bottom. Um, and so the water just goes in, but it actually never really goes out. Uh, so you fill up the top bed, um, and then if the storm is big enough, you fill up the next bed, and then you fill up the next bed, and so on. Um, but the water doesn't 
flow through in, in the way that it would with a stream um, in, in a large storm event. Um, and so that's an important feature to know about. And the city of Portland actually stopped putting two entrances into their, their, bell, their, their, their beds, and now they just put one in each bed to acknowledge that the, the water doesn't actually uh, flow through, but uh, flows, um, or just is going to flow into each bed one at a time. Uh, once we get the water in there, um, we have to account for the fact that at some point there may be too much water. Um, and so we, we've got this idea of a raised inlet, uh, which generally people put too low. This one was set flush to grade, so it really was providing no head. Um, and that's Tom Lipton's hand showing me uh, uh, how high it should have been set at. Um, it's very important that we get these um, uh, inlets raised up. Uh, to a very, very high elevation. Um, and the, 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 the math on this, while it's not rocket science, is pretty critical. Um, this is an uh, exfiltration pipe in a silver cell system, um, which looks really cool and, and is, is going to, to have a, a massive amount of water distribution uh, across there. Um, but for some reason, this bed which had very, very sandy soil, and it drained way too fast. Um, and part of the problem, I think, was that the pipe you see on the left side is running right along the edge of the bed. And there is a gravel uh, layer outside of the filter cloth. Um, and I think the water just went uh, right. It, it, it always goes in the path of least resistance. And went instead of going through the soil, just goes right into the gravel uh, around the system and, and bypasses uh, the whole. Um, uh, the whole process. So th this one, by the way, was wrapped in filter cloth uh, because they, it was a test cell and they didn't want uh, uh, to get uh, any um, outside uh, sediments or, or movement of water, uh, groundwater, into this. So that was actually, I think it was an impervious li liner. Um, but the uh, uh, we, we, we do not recommend uh, putting filter cloth or, or impervious liners around uh, these systems. So because these systems have to be quite large uh, and there's not all that much space in the urban environment, um, uh, we've been using the silver cells to bring uh, part of that soil um, underneath the sidewalk um, uh, as, as a way of, of making the, the overall soil system um, much larger. Um, this particular one in Aurora uses uh, pervious pavers um, over the top of the, the silver cells. And I think that's probably the best way to bring water into any of these systems. The pervious pavers uh, screen out all of the large coarse sediments um, and floatables and leaves so they don't become a problem. The water then is evenly distributed across the top of, of the system um, and, and moves into the water. Um, I think that there's still some problems with this sketch about places I can see where water might want to bypass the whole system with all those gravel uh, layers that are wrapping around um, the sides and the bottom. And so we have to be very careful about um, the kinds of gravels that we use uh, and the the, the way that water may flow around the edges um, and bottoms um, of any of these systems, whether they're made with silver cells or any other uh, other approach. Okay, so finally, we have to get the water out of the of the system. Um, so uh, we need to know first of all when do we need a pipe under drain. Um, uh, we need to understand the, the, the function of geotextiles. I want to talk about this upturned elbow idea, um, impervious layers, um, the raised drain pipes, which I actually already covered a little bit, and flow modification devices. So the basic idea of a bioretention cell um, is the water goes in the top. It can flow into the soil um, and, and work its way through the system. Um, but if the, the soil below uh, the bioretention soil isn't draining, doesn't have reliable percolation, we've been adding uh, perforated underdrains um, in, 
into the system. And often those uh, perforated under drains are, are wrapped uh, in geotextiles or some other kind of uh, geotextile uh, separation. And the geotextile, uh, I would just get rid of uh, completely and opting for a coarse sand um, uh, layer that wraps around the pipe, uh, a coarse sand being uh, uh, sand that would be used to make concrete. So ASTM C33 concrete sand is um, uh, the, 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 the way to, to go. Um, now often we'll, we'll have our soil tested during the design phase to see if, it's use, if, it, if it will percolate. Um, and that may make some sense, uh, but you really need to do a field test. If the engineer just comes back and says, well, it's a, a silty loam and it's going to drain at 0 .002 inches an hour, and you ask him, where did you get that number? And he said, I looked it up in a book. Well, that's the number when that soil has been completely um, uh, graded and, and crushed and doesn't have any structure left. Um, actually, clay soils and silt soils can drain uh, quite well if they still have their structure uh, intact. Um, what you really need to know is how fast does not dough the, uh, the existing soil drain after construction. That's when you need to test it. Um, unfortunately, by the time you get that far, it's too late to add a, a drain system if it doesn't work out. So I recommend that you put uh, a drain, a perforated gender drain, in any urban site uh, because having positive drainage is, is absolutely uh, critical to the success of the system. But the problem with the underdrain is it can drain, because these sandy soils are so uh, free draining, they can drain too fast. Uh, so this idea has been developed called the, the upturned elbow, where the drain line switches from perforated drains to a solid drain line. It goes up vertically uh, partway through the soil and then back down again um, and then out to the outfall. And all the water uh, below the invert of the upturned elbow becomes retention soil. The, the, the water can't get out of that layer. Um, and that is great if you've got some amount of, of infiltration into the surrounding soil. You don't need much, um, half an inch an hour, a quarter of an inch an hour. Um, uh, but, but by having that detention soil above of, of that invert number, um, you'll still keep the root zone um, above that uh, perfectly adequate to get the, tree, the plants established. And the plants actually are a great pump, and they'll pump water out of the detention zone um, uh, rather quickly. The, the main reason for doing this, though, is that we want the water to pass completely through the soil column before it hits the perforated drain line. Um, but we don't want it to go out too fast. So the upturned elbow holds a small amount of water in the bottom of the system. Um, and we get much, much better um, uh, filtering of uh, chemicals and a much longer um, uh, time of, of release on the water by, by putting that upturned elbow. Also note down there, it says glued joints are required to make this work. So the pipe fittings have to be glued together um, in order to make this work. Otherwise, you've got pressurized water, and it's going to start leaking all over the place. Now, in some areas of the country, like Houston, um, this is a map of, of expansive clay soils in the United States. And the red and the blue areas are places where you may have uh, areas of expansive clay soils. If you start trying to infiltrate into um, those soils, uh, you're going to make a, uh, an expanding soil situation that is intolerable by the engineering community. Um, and so in Houston, you have to put a, a, um, uh, a, a, an impervious layer, um, uh, a sheet membrane, um, to wrap your system. Once you do that, you are totally dependent on that drainage system in order to make this thing work. So those ideas have to be really carefully thought out uh, when you put a impervious layer in. 
Um, this was a detail in San Diego. Um, for some reason, they also required an impervious layer in some parts of the city. Um, and I noticed that they, in, when they did that, they put the perforated drain up high. Well, the, the bottom 12 inches of water is just going to sit in that system, and it's not going anywhere. Um, so when you've got an impervious layer, the drain line has got to go at the bottom. And then uh, you can't use the upturn elbow uh, because uh, you, 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 you have to get all that water out of there. So that means that the control of the, how fast the water goes out is either by how fast does it drain through the soil, or you may have to use a flow modification device, uh, which is basically just a valve on the exit pipe that allows you to control how fast the water actually goes out of that system. Um, about the only, it's, this is probably the best way of dealing uh, when you have uh, to put an impervious liner in there, you need a flow modification um, a valve uh, on the, the exit pipe or your system to slow that water down. OK, Can so I the I last. Can for one second? I'm sorry. Sure. I just want to do a time check. It's about noon, yep. so I just want to let you know that. Um, and we OK, have yep, and I'm, I'm aware that I'm r run out of time. <laughs> no, um, no, no, it's great. I'm sure everybody's yep. happy to listen. Just wanted yep. to. Type in. OK, thank yep. you. So the last uh, function is system maintenance. And we're just completely ignoring this. If you're designing one of these systems, make sure you talk to the person who's going to maintain it. Um, that, that person should be an integral part of the, um, uh, the design process. What are their capabilities? Is there even anybody identified to maintain this? Um, you know, has the system been designed to be maintained? Uh, so those are all questions. I'm not going to tell you. Uh, essentially, I've already told you how to design the system so it's more maintainable. Um, but the, the critical thing is, is that person um, identified? And if they're not, I wouldn't tread much uh, further into the design of these systems if I haven't got somebody to maintain it. So where was the tree in all this discussion? Um, basically, if you get the, the, the design of this thing correct, the tree is going to grow well. Um, if these systems are designed correctly, they're actually dry environments, not wet. Uh, so we don't need to use uh, water uh, like red maples and bald cypress. We really want to be using trees that, that survive in, in, in that are good drought tolerant trees, because these soils are usually more uh, drought, um, uh, droughty than they are wet. Um, the, the volume of soil that we need to really treat the water in these systems is the same amount of soil that we need for the tree. So by, by providing large soil volumes, which we need for the water, the tree will grow, grow better. The tree grows better in these unscreened soils. And drainage rates of 2 to 3 inches an hour is great for both water and trees. And finally, if you're putting the tree into the system, Locate the tree on a slightly mounded area. Um, if you're using silver cells, the, the tree is going to be um, outside the system and usually up at the pavement level. So it's already going to be on a little mound um, within the system. But if you're designing an open system, put the tree up on a little mound. And you can actually use the tree as those check dams that I talked about. Um, and if you just put them um, just a little upstream from the, the opening, uh, uh, of, of each of these cells, you can create little natural check dams uh, with the tree. So that uh, concludes the presentation. Sorry, I have bumped into the time schedule, but I have I'm here to answer questions. Great, thanks, Jim, and thanks for bearing with all of the uh, technical difficulties and being so game. Um, uh, we do. It looks from the numbers like a bunch of people have been able to get through, and and I just want to. Apologize again, um, GoToMeeting, we learned, did have a major service disruption right as this webinar was starting. The timing could not have been worse. So um, my apologies to everyone again. And for those of you who are on the call, um, let's answer some questions. And please uh, send questions in as well. Um, I think we have a fewer than usual because of the disruption. So Jim, um, let's start with the first question and go back to the beginning. Can you? review the concept of a soil ped again so that everybody understands what we're talking about? OK. Uh, Just in broad terms. Right. Uh, let me uh, 
the back of that, that one slide um, fairly early on. Come on, there we go. Okay. Okay. So there is pictures of different kinds of soils, and you see in the unscreened sandy loam soil there are clumps or clods or peds of soil, okay. and soil, uh, natural soil, uh, is stuck together uh, with soil biology, the clays, the silts, which are stickier than the yeah. sands. Um, if you go out in any pile of, of loosely graded soil, you'll see just clumps of, of dirt uh, that, that are in the pile. And those are the peds that have been broken apart. Um, and some of them can be in a clay soil. You might have peds the size of a volleyball or, or a, a large beach ball. Um, down to in a sandier soil, it may, the peds may only be the size of golf balls. Whatever size they are, they're still very important um, to the, the way the soil drains when we put it back in. So the more, the more of these peds I can retain and the larger the peds are, um, the, the better the soil is going to function uh, in terms of, of drainage. So if I could have a soil that was all peds and it was a heavy clay soil, um, and there was almost no fines in it, I bet you that soil would drain at 10 inches an hour, clay mm -hmm. soil. OK. Thanks for that sufficient? review. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, let's go to another question. Um, this one is about biochar. Is biochar a beneficial material in bioretention soil mixes? OK. I think the jury is still out on biochar. I would like to think that, that biochar will be um, something good for us. Um, they're, they're, it's, it's still in the testing phase. My problem, my biggest problem with it right now is it's very expensive and the source is, is fairly limited in, in its, its sourcing. So you would need a lot of it. Um, and getting good quality biochar is frankly just expensive. So in, in our area, in most of the United States where you, where uh, with the exception of really dry areas in the, in the southwest where we have really good compost sources. Uh, I think you can achieve the same thing with compost, good, good quality compost, at, at much lower cost. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some very specialized things in terms of filtering phosphorus that biochar uh, may do better than compost, and compost actually can be a, a, a phosphorus uh, um, contributor uh, into the water. So when you first put it in, your, your, your bioretention bed might actually be producing more phosphorus in the outflow than the inflow. Um, I don't think that happens with biochar. Um, but we, we, need, we need to, we, it still needs work. Um, but if somebody wants to experiment with it, there, there doesn't appear to be much of a downside to it, um, except for the fact that it is very expensive. I haven't used it yet but I've, I've looked into it and been to a number of seminars on it. OK, great. Thanks, Jim. Um, OK, let's go to the bioretention soil mix idea. When you talk about um, the 30% soil in an ideal mix, what, what are you defining in that 30%? OK, that would be a natural um, clay loam, uh, s uh, sandy clay loam uh, soil. Um, could be a sandy loam soil, but I don't want to get it too sandy because uh, I'm getting all my sand from the, 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 the coarse sand that I'm putting in the mix. Um, but I'm putting it in there to slow that sand down. So this sand compost bioretention mix that you see uh, in this image, which is a 20% a compost and 80% sand, which is currently the standard mix in much of the US, um, will drain it. 10 to 20 inches an hour. I mean, it's just way too fast. Um, Bill Hunt in North Carolina came up with some calculations that says that once a soil drains more than about 5 inches an hour, uh, you're not getting much uh, use out of it. it uh, you don't get uh, uh, chemical uh, reduction, and you don't get a lot of uh, uh, reduction in, in uh, downstream flows. The wa water just goes through it too fast. Um, uh, and I'm not sure why this mix developed. I think it, it's, a, it's kind of a foolproof, never fails mix, 
it, it never clogs, so it always works. And I think it comes from that attitude of the engineer is that we don't ever want to have a condition where water is, is held up in these systems. Um, and so from an engineering standpoint, they work, but are they really accomplishing the goal that we're actually doing this for? Um, I, I don't think that they're nearly as good as a soil that we can um, uh, slow down by adding um, some real soil to the mix. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, in situations where permeable pavers are being used to get water into a system, how frequently do they need to be cleaned? Okay. Um, that to? somewhat is so, somewhat dependent on the the bedding material. A lot of people are using sand um, uh, as the bedding material and joint material, and that's not a, the, the right material. You should be using number eight stone. Uh, which is uh, kind of a uh, very coarse-looking sand, but it's a little bit coarser than than uh, than coarse sand. Um, and we're finding that that uh, lasts an awful lot longer um, uh, and flows better than sand. Um, the second part of the equation is what is the silt load uh, upstream? Uh, so if you're in a highly urbanized area, which has very, very little uh, garden beds or open soil above you, uh, upstream, um, it may be that these pavers uh, need very, very little maintenance. Um, if you're in a parking lot where there are parking beds or, or planting beds around the edges um, where there can be a, a fair amount of silt in the soil, uh, it may be that these things have to be power washed um, uh, and swept. Um, I don't know if it's every year. I keep hearing people say once a year, but I, I don't see it happening. Um, I would look at um, uh, uh, Bob France's book on, on uh, water uh, uh, design and who is the other guy, the guy at the University of Georgia. Um, uh, my brain is not. <laughs> the guy who wrote the book called Pervious Pavers. Of course, Ferguson, Bruce Ferguson. Uh, wrote a book called Pervious Pavers. Um, I can't imagine how you'd write uh, 500 pages or more on just pervious pavers, but he did. Um, and I bet you the answer is in there. All right. Um, let's go to the next question, and we'll we'll go through a few more of these. I know we're we're um, over our time, but I see that a lot of people are still on, so I want to try to get to some of these. Um, two common issues that we hear about trees in bioretention are one sandy soil may not support trees, and two, leaves that fall on pavement end up adding to the gross solid load to streams, especially in urban areas. Can you speak to either of those points, Jim? OK. Um, well, if you have a really high sand soil, uh, as these uh, bioretention mixes are, I'm not sure the trees are going to grow all that well unless it's irrigated. Um, trees grow well OK in sand. Um, and that's why trees and golf courses are, are so much of a conflict, because the, the trees the trees will grow in there just as well as the, uh, the, the grass roots if it's irrigated. Um, many or most of these uh, bioretention mix, uh, facilities are not irrigated, which I think is a good idea. They, they shouldn't need to be irrigated. Um, and I think they're going to be too dry until the organic load in the, the, the overall system increases. Um, it's, it's interesting that over time, trees are net contributors of organic matter to the soil. Um, and uh, so I think they will slow the systems down uh, uh, quite nicely over the long period if they, if they can get through the initial drought uh, problem. As far as the stability of the tree, um, in, it, in very, very large trees, uh, there may be some long-term stability issues, but most of these beds are so small um, and so contained. I'm, I'm not expecting that we're going to get uh, uh, 75 or 100-year-old trees out of, out of these systems. Um, and I, I, I'm not sure they're, they're going to get big enough uh, to have a stability problem. Um, and then as far as the leaf load, yeah, the, 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 we spent a whole portion of this um, uh, discussion talking about the, the leaf load. 
um, the, the buyer attention mix itself does a great job of, of um, uh, stopping the leaves from uh, or organic debris from going through into the down, downstream source. But it's the overflow uh, during large storm events. Uh, but in most urban areas, there's a pretty good leaf collection. Um, uh, I mean, we do, we do a pretty good job of picking up leaves in, in our, our downtown. Um, so I'm not expecting uh, that we're contributing a huge amount. And certainly, uh, there's a lot less leaves coming off of an urban area than there is a forest. And we have our, and our forest uh, streams are our cleanest streams that we have. Um, so I'm not sure why getting leaves downstream is, is, is a problem. OK. How much role does regionality play in the design process and also in the maintenance of a, a system that's using trees and soil for our water management? OK. Well, I think that in, your really, in really cold environments, um, the salt issue um, it's one that we we got to come to grips with. Uh, I don't think that uh, in most systems that I've seen, um, with the except with this again, this exception of retail environments, for some reason shop owners pour more salt out um, than anybody else. But like a typical parking lot, the actual amount of salt coming down is is much lower than the amount of salt put down in, on sidewalks. Um, so in a place like Toronto, where I have a lot of experience, we don't seem to have a salt problem in, in most uh, of our tree conditions, um, with the exception of retail, uh, major retail streets. Um, uh, at the other end of the extreme, in, in, in hot, dry areas, you've got the, the, the problem of having enough water to keep the plants alive. Um, and it, so, you know, but that's really a, a plant problem. Um, and I, again, I think making uh, a heavier soil um, will will help extend out the the, n the number of days when you might have to irrigate because um, these mixes are going to be very very dry. Um, and then in the, the the temperate parts, you're you're really concerned about this leaf uh, collection in the in the. Um, four bays, and so I think in, in our temperate areas, the four bays have to be much, much larger because we're going to produce an awful lot more organic matter and or, organic material coming off the trees, um, so we need bigger four bays. There are probably many, many other regional uh, ideas, not to mention the fact that the plants will be different um, uh, and the sources of soil and all of that will be different. Uh, um, but those would be the major pieces that I would think about. Mm -hmm. You mentioned a, a, a number of sites through the presentation um, and showed us some examples. Um, one attendee wants to know whether you conduct soil biology testing and monitoring on these sites pre and post con construction, and whether um, you've researched the role of microbiology in nutrient cycling organic matter around the tree. Okay. Well, uh, I, I have not done any testing. I've read a lot about it. Um, it would seem, uh, from what I've read, is that if we have the organic matter in the soil, the compost, at the right level, um, and we have air and water moving through this system, the soil biology will be there. It may not be optimized for the soil biology community, um, but it's still adequate uh, to, to break down material um, if, if you have, for example, an, uh, an anaerobic layer in your soil, uh, which is soil bio simply soil biology breaking down um, the material, um, I can take compost or even wood chips um, that have very little soil biology on it, put it in a jar, um, and, and seal the jar up and come back in two weeks. And I'll find that when I open the jar, um, I've got an anaerobic odor in there because the, 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 the soil biology in that water, that, you know, this is perfectly clean water when I put it in, um, drinkable water. There was enough biology on those wood chips to start the process. Um, uh, the same way when you have a, a vase of flowers, putting clean water, you put in fresh cut flowers, you put them in there, 
And um, after a couple of weeks, or a week, as the flowers are dying, you'll notice that the waters turn cloudy. Um, it's turned cloudy because of biology. Um, and biology is everywhere. Uh, we're breathing it all in. Uh, it's covering. Um, I, 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 re I heard from now three different sources, so I think it's probably correct, that for every cell in our body, there are 10 other cells of biology, of other organisms that live on us and within us. And so there's actually more of them than us on each of our bodies. Well, that's an exciting so thought. I'm, I'm not at all concerned about the fact that the biology is there. Um, um, and I know that if I keep the air and water uh, uh, correct, uh, the biology will, will do what it needs to do. Great. Well, let's just take a couple more um, before we wrap up. The next one is about the use of mulch in bioretention cells. Um, one, should it be used at all? And two, how do you prevent the creation of anaerobic conditions, especially when maintenance staff have a culture of overusing and relying heavily on mulch to prevent weeds? Yeah, I, I think mulch is a big problem. Uh, I, I think. Uh, that the, the, a lot of the failures that I've seen in these systems have been related to mulch, um, and, and so I, I'm. If I was going to, I, I would put compost um, in the soil and till it into the surface soil to, to boost the the upper level soil biology. Um, but I, I'm, the more I work on these things, the more I think we should just get rid of the mulch. And I, and I know the mulch does some things, and there, there are some upsides to mulch, um, but there's an awful lot of downside to mulch, too. Um, and if I had to pick, I think I'd, I'd, I'd err on the side of get, either reducing or getting rid of mulch than um, uh, trying to, to worry about what the, the good things that it, that it does. And I think you can get those good things with compost um, in the upper, upper soil layer. OK. Um, all right, let's go to uh, our second to last question. This has to do with sourcing soils that contain PEDS. How do you, this is sort of more of a technical, technical question, how can you make sure that your specs include that and, uh, and are followed? Okay, now I'll, I'll take the exception of New York City and Long Island. There are almost no soil pads on Long Island because it's, it's basic glacial sandy loam. So it's actually, I'm using the straight Long Island soil from almost anywhere on Long Island um, as my soil mix. I don't put anything in it, maybe a little compost. Um, but there are no pads out there. Uh, so if you're in a really sandy uh, place, um, you're not going to have soil pads. Uh, so you've got to find either a, a sandy loam soil that's up in the the top end of the sandy loam box on the USDA chart. Remember that all sandy loam soil is not the same. Um, um, drifting into the clay loam, the sandy clay loam box, and over into the loam and even into the silty uh, loam soils. Um, all the edges of the loam soil box on the USDA chart will give you, will give you soils that have good soil pads. So it's a very, very large area. And almost anywhere in the country, with the exception of Long Island and probably a few other places, um, you're going to be able to find, find soils. The key is getting them so they're not screened. And um, that's probably the harder part. I, you see people, and they just take these beautiful soils, and they always come through in a screener. And then all the pads are gone. Um, and it, it, it's more a political and educational problem than it is finding the, the soil. Those soils exist. Um, and you might, for example, if you're in the Pacific Northwest, you're going to have to accept a fairly large amount of rock in your soil if you don't screen it. Rocks will not be a problem. Uh, a rock never killed a tree. Um, it will help with the drainage. Uh, so open your window up. Uh, for rock and, and maybe let 8 or 10 percent of the total volume be rock if you're in the Pacific Northwest. Um, uh, rocks and tree roots and all kinds of other things that you'll find in each market area. So you need to know your market area. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, let's have our last question then. You talked about under drains being wrapped. Um, you talked about under drains. Sorry, the question is, should the under drains be wrapped with geotextiles to ensure roots don't migrate and clog the pipes. 
Right. Absolutely not. Do not ever use filter cloth around a pipe. Um, the roots, there, there may be some root intrusion in there, but long before the root ever gets into the pipe and um, clogs the, uh, the pipe, and I have seen roots growing in pipes, but they generally don't clog drain lines because they're pretty dry environments. They're humid, and you will find a, a collection of roots in there, uh, but not like a sewer line where you've got a, a flow of high, a sanitary sewer line will become clogged by tree roots. But drain lines generally do not. Um, but I can guarantee you that while sometimes the tree root will clog the drain line, almost all the time the, the filter cloth will become clogged with soil within the first uh, two to five years. Um, it just seems to be a very consistent pattern. Uh, so your chances of, of the system failing um, is much greater with filter cloth than it is worrying about the tree roots. Okay, good to know. Well, I want to thank everyone for attending the webinar today, uh, for bearing with our technical issues, and for submitting questions, those of you who did. A link to the recording of the webinar will be sent out to everyone later this afternoon. We'll also be posting it on the Deep Root YouTube channel, so feel free to share that around for people who weren't able to sign on. Um, and remember that you can find information about Deep Root on our website and on our blog, which is updated three times a week. And you can buy Jim's book, Up by Roots, on Amazon, and a link to that will also go out in the follow-up email later this afternoon. Jim, thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you.